Hello, and thank you all for joining us on our latest installment of the series, Visual DX Academy Master Educational Program. My name is Dr. Stephen Chen, and I'm the Clinical Director of Education for Visual DX. We are thrilled to bring you another important conversation, and tonight it's titled Common and Serious Skin Conditions in Patients of Color. I want to begin by thanking the series sponsor, Janssen Pharmaceuticals, for supporting the effort. Before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to mention a few things. This presentation is being recorded and will be shared to all registrants. We've allotted time today for questions. Within your screen, you should see the Q&A tab and feel free to enter your questions throughout the panel presentation and discussion. Along the top of your window, you should also see that we have an educational supplement for you to download. After the Q&A period, we'll be testing your knowledge with a Kahoot quiz where there'll be a prize, so you'll wanna stick around for that. Okay, let me introduce our presenter. Dr. Andrew Alexis is the Vice Chair for Diversity and Inclusion for the Department of Dermatology and Professor of Clinical Dermatology at Weill Cornell Medical College in New York City. He's the former chair of the Department of Dermatology at Mount Sinai Morningside and Mount Sinai West. Having served as director of the first of its kind Skin of Color Center for over 15 years, his work has helped to advance patient care, research, and education pertaining to dermatologic disorders that are prevalent in populations with skin of color. Dr. Alexis has published more than 90 articles in peer-reviewed journals, including the British Journal of Dermatology, the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology, and JAMA Dermatology, among others. He's co-edited two textbooks and authored over 10 book chapters. Dr. Alexis has appeared on ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox television news programs, has been quoted in numerous leading publications, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Vogue, Allure, and Essence. He is listed in Castle Connolly's Top Doctors and Super Doctors. Thank you for taking the time to discuss common and serious skin condi conditions in patients of color, Dr. Alexis. Let's begin. Well, thank you, Dr. Chen, for that warm introduction. And thank you to everyone, everybody for tuning in uh, to this program. Uh, so it's my pleasure to, to give this broad overview of common and serious skin conditions that you um, should be able to recognize in your patients with skin of color or richly pigmented skin. Um, just a, a general um, disclaimer, terms of use. Um, the, all the images shown here are the property of Visual DX and some of the images are my own um, and uh, they should not be uh, used without uh, permission. My disclosures are shown here as well. So when we think about um, the population that we, that we describe as having skin of color, the term skin of color is used to describe this very broad and diverse uh, set of populations that would be characterized by having richly pigmented skin and often self-identifying as any of the um, uh, non-white racial ethnic groups. And from a global perspective, people with skin of color would represent the majority of the world's population. And here in the US, um, by 2044, it's estimated that more than half of the US will belong to any of the non-white racial ethnic groups and hence would uh, have skin of color. And so with that in mind, as physicians and healthcare providers who take care of dermatologic disorders, it becomes increasingly important to understand any nuances in clinical presentation and uh, uh, other aspects with the overlap between structural and functional differences and cultural variations of skin and hair care practices, as well as cultural variations and perceptions of beauty and health, which can influence the clinical presentation, the epidemiology, and the quality of life of dermatologic disorders. So with that background, we're gonna talk about a set of disorders uh, that include common disorders that can affect anyone of any background, but when they present in populations with skin of color, there tend to be some special considerations or unique clinical manifestations that are important to recognize. There are also a set of dermatologic disorders that are uh, disproportionately seen in patients with skin of color, and we will cover uh, some of those as well. And then the third category would be um, serious uh, skin conditions that uh, are important to catch because they may have uh, uh, systemic and other major health implications, and because we know of, uh, of uh, uh, due to educational gaps, there's a risk of delays in diagnosis. We hope that with this program, you'll be able to um, better 
diagnose the features or better detect the features of even serious conditions that can present in the skin. So let's start with common dermatologic disorders, again, ones that can affect anyone but have uh, clinical variations in richly pigmented skin types. I think acne is a great place to start, great example of a common disorder that when acne presents in patients with skin of color, in addition to the papules, the pustules, the comedones, the, the features of the primary lesions of acne, there's also the concomitant post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation in, in, many, in the majority of cases. In fact, the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is often just as disfiguring, sometimes more disfiguring than the acne itself. And, uh, and patients themselves um, uh, often, uh, uh, it's usually the PIH, the post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation that drives the patient to seek care in many cases. Um, so this is an example of a mixture of active infl inflammatory papules, which have more of a reddish brown color, color. And then sort of on the lower part of the slide, you'll see um, these hyperpigmented macules, which represent post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Now, uh, the, the name is a bit of a misnomer because it's not exactly just something that is seen after all the inflammation is gone. You can, you can also see hyperpigmentation uh, in areas where there's ongoing inflammation clinically or subclinically. Um, in this slide on the left, we have a collection of mostly comedones and some papules concentrated on the forehead. And the purpose of this slide is to show that there a variant of acne um, called pomade acne uh, can be seen in the context of hair care products that are comedogenic. Uh, and of course, uh, the use of such products, uh, products can vary across different populations and, and some populations of color may be more likely to use certain hair care pro products that might be comedogenic. And if they seep down onto the forehead can produce this variant of acne. On the right is an example of severe nodulocystic acne. And it's, it's important to recognize that in addition to pigmentary sequelae from this sort of acne, there is also uh, a very high chance of scarring, both atrophic scars, but even keloidal or hypertrophic scars can occur as a result of this. And we often see those on, on the trunk, uh, the keloids that is, as a result of, of severe acne. So it's important not to under treat acne and really incorporate a comprehensive uh, management plan that will reduce the, the development of sequelae over time. Now, rosacea is a example of a condition that can affect any population, but is very under-recognized in skin of color. Uh, this is because uh, most studies, most textbook examples, most materials found uh, on, online and uh, other publicly available sources will depict um, rosacea in individuals of European ancestry, usually Northern European ancestry. Uh, and uh, so there's generally low awareness that rosacea can also occur in populations with skin of color, and it does, and it's not rare. Uh, in order to uh, be able to detect it, um, it, in addition to looking for erythema, sometimes the symptomatology can really be the first trigger to um, raise one's suspicion. So patients will often describe a sensation of warmth on their cheeks, which correlates with flushing. And on close inspection, one can see a, a sort of hyperchromia, if not uh, pure redness. This image shown on the, on, on the, on the uh, presentation, the redness is very easy to see. Uh, uh, you can clearly make out the erythema on the cheek and you can see pustules and papules. But there are instances, uh, particularly in very deeply pigmented uh, Fitzpatrick type 6 skin, may not uh, see the erythema as clearly as in this picture. And this is where symptomatology, good, good lighting, uh, even dioscopy, uh, using a glass slide to be able to detect the, um, the erythema uh, in the cheeks is helpful. Um, some more examples of on the left of inflammatory papules 
Note the absence of comedones. That's what helps support. That's typical of rosacea to differentiate it from, from acne and the background of erythema. One might also see telangiectasias, especially uh, in the nasal and medial cheek area. On the right, we have an example of ocular rosacea. So we must not forget that many uh, patients with rosacea also have features of ocular with a foreign body sensation um, and, and uh, um, uh, redness um, and uh, other symptoms, signs and symptoms that uh, can be managed with oral doxycycline. So another condition that uh, again affects the, the population at large, but when, when it presents in skin of color can, can have uh, some different clinical presentations and morphologies, and this is atopic dermatitis. So whereas on the left, it, uh, a common sort of textbook-like example of uh, bright red erythema scaling and lichenification in an individual with lightly pigmented skin. On the right, in an individual with skin of color, the erythema here, while it is present, it is not a bright red. That is not what the eye catches. And instead, it's more of a subtle uh, um, grayish brown with hints of, of red, and you can see the scale and lichenification. And it's important to be able to, to see this and not dismiss it as just dry skin and, and uh, carefully tease out those hues of, 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 um, of red, reddish brown within the, the lesion. Here's some other examples. This is a good example of sort of red, the red brown hue uh, in the involved area. And you can see um, lichenification and scaling. And a nice way to really increase accuracy is to sort of calibrate your eye first to non lesional skin and then move on to lesional skin and, and do a sort of delta in your mind. And then you can really appreciate the change in color, uh, uh, not to mention the changes in, in, in texture and other, other, other uh, manifestations. Um, the term hyperchromia is one that some authors have used to describe um, inflammation in the skin as opposed to erythema, since erythema, uh, by definition, uh, does to describe redness. And the bottom line is that in the broad spectrum of skin complexions that we see, the, the clinical marker of inflammation in the skin may not be truly red, uh, and we must broaden our color palette. And so to get away from being fixated on red and potentially miss diagnoses or under uh, uh, appreciate the severity of inflammatory conditions like atopic dermatitis, the term hyperchromia or increased color might be a better term, sort of more neutral. Here's uh, another example where um, this is clearly extremely inflamed, extremely active. This is a severe atopic derm uh, plaque of, of uh, atopic dermatitis with severe lichenification, and scaling, and elevation. Uh, I'm sure the patient would complain of severe pruritus as well. Um, and, and the key is to, again, look first at the non-lesional skin, then look at the lesional skin. And wow, what a difference in color. And now you can start to tease up some reddish brown, hints of violet there too. This is vi somewhat violaceous as well. And, uh, and so you would certainly not wanna make the mistake that this is just sort of dry skin or just mild eczema when it's truly uh, quite severe. So I think we can agree it's at least moderate and pushing towards the severe end of the spectrum. Um, here's another example of the sort of red-brown color. This is on the popliteal fossa uh, of this patient. Again, looking, looking at the normal skin first, then the lesional skin in the popliteal fossa. Now we appreciate that color change. Um, there, there are hints of, of violet here, as well as red-brown. We can see excoriation, we can see scale. And if we were able to palpate this, and, and you could see on side lighting that, uh, that, that these lesions are also elevated, they are plaques. Here's a, a, a great example of very severe um, atopic dermatitis and uh, sort of teasing out these little tiny islands of normal, of somewhat spared skin, non-lesional skin circled here. 
and then looking at the rest of the skin. And now we really appreciate how inflamed this really is and see those uh, shades in this case of, of violaceous to gray, as well as shades of red brown, depending on which sections of the back we're looking at. You can see the scaling and there's um, um, the lesions are, are, are clearly elevated as well and excoriated. So I've had instances where trainees, depending on their level of, of experience, might go in to the clinics, uh, into the patient's uh, room, come exam room, come back out, present to me and say the patient just has dry skin, um, missing the fact that this is all uh, very active, um, actively inflamed because of the atopic dermatitis. Another example, this is a, a, a good example of the purple or violet to gray, grayish brown uh, hues that you can often see in type six skin. Looking at these darker areas, these hyperchromatic areas, it's important not to call them hyperpigmentation. Um, it's not just post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. These areas all across the chest are active. It's not post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. It, they, they, you can see the, the violaceous hue even in these very dark areas. And of course, in real life, we would palpate and side light and be able to really see that, that, that these are um, plaques. Okay, another example where it's important to differentiate active eczematous lesions for, from post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation as in a, a, an area that uh, is now macular without any active uh, dermatitis and it just has the pigment alteration. So these areas circled while on first glance might suggest, okay, maybe the patient has post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, but clearly on closer inspection, these areas are raised um, and they have a viol slightly violaceous hue. And, and in the case of the top one, there's excoriation as well. Um, so these are all active areas and we wanna make a special effort not to um, miss active areas and mistake them for mm -hmm. hyperpigmentation. Another feature of atopic dermatitis that we see more commonly in skin of color, in particular individuals of African ancestry, is we see this, uh, what's called the follicular um, morphology or follicular accentuation, of sometimes called micropapular morphology. So it's a collection of one to two millimeter papules um, that um, are pruritic, they have a little scale, um, and if one was to biopsy them, they would see the hallmarks of an eczematous dermatitis with spongiosis. So uh, patients might present with this and without an actual scaly lichenified plaque, and might just see these, uh, these papules. So important to recognize those. There's also a tendency um, for a papulonodular variant or morphology or papillonodular morphology of atopic dermatitis, which might be more common in populations of color, including uh, those of African descent. Um, the bottom line is actually more studies are needed to really understand population differences, but uh, uh, it's been observed uh, by myself and many other um, uh, uh, authors who see uh, um, uh, large patients with skin of populations with skin of color that we frequently see these papillonodular uh, morphologies that resemble pirago nodularis. So in some, when we look at atopic dermatitis, we recognize it's an extremely heterogeneous disease clinically, uh, heterogeneous by age, by anatomic location, and also by um, uh, racial ethnic population and skin type. And we're just beginning to really understand the, the population differences um, in terms of uh, uh, clinical subtypes and, and endotypes. Um, this is an example of, of a patient of East Asian ancestry to highlight the fact that it has been reported that uh, clinically uh, there may be overlapping features with psoriasis in, in atopic dermatitis patients of East Asian ancestry. Uh, and uh, that is to say that the lesions may be a little bit more well demarcated. They might have scale that's, uh, uh, that resembles psoriasis uh, and uh, even histologically might have features of psoriasis too. 
immunophenotypically, uh, these patients have been shown to have a skewing towards TH17. Uh, and so this is a very interesting uh, subtype of AD that's been reported more frequently in East Asian populations. What about individuals of African descent? Well, a small study done in New York City uh, did find that in amongst African-American patients with atopic dermatitis, the, the um, cytokine uh, uh, profile was skewed towards Th2, Th22 expression with attenuation of Th17. So there may be distinct uh, endotypes that are more commonly seen in specific populations. But again, I think we're still in the early stages of, of understanding these. Pigmentary sequelae as a result of atopic dermatitis. Similar to uh, my comments in acne with atopic dermatitis, pigmentary uh, uh, sequelae are also extremely disfiguring and, and burdensome to patients. So in addition to the signs and symptoms of, of the eczema itself, the long-lasting hyperpigmentation uh, and hypopigmentation uh, can occur as a result of atopic dermatitis. And so it just uh, speaks to the importance of early and, long, and effective longitudinal control of the disease to help minimize these additional sequelae. Psoriasis is another example of a chronic inflammatory disorder of the skin where there are variations in clinical features and morphology in skin of color. Uh, in some cases, like the one shown here, one can easily make out the redness of the plaques and, um, and you can see how well sharply demarcated they are and that silvery um, scale is so characteristic of psoriasis. Examples here on the one on the left, sharply demarcated. You can still make out some erythema in the plaques. Um, and uh, but on the right, uh, the erythema is is now uh, sort of masked or muted, uh, altered by background melanin. And this is something that does happen in the spectrum of psoriasis. And so again, we're broadening our palette and including violaceous hues, red-brown hues, grayish hues, looking at other features like the borders and how sharp they are, the scale, the quality of the scale, the distribution anatomically. Um, and in some cases, a biopsy would be needed to differentiate this from uh, other papulosquamous disorders. Pityriasis rosea is another inflammatory disorder with unique manifestations. It turns out that uh, in one study out in Michigan, about a third of, of uh, patients of African descent uh, with pityriasis rosea presented with um, these this, this morphology shown here, which is uh, mostly um, uh, in papules, scaly papules uh, distributed uh, widely across the, the, the trunk as opposed to the scaly oval erythematous plaques with trailing scale um, that is like shown on the left that is more commonly seen in, in, the, uh, in the textbooks and in um, pop populations of European ancestry. So we might see instead these exuberant uh, er erythematous scaly papules uh, involving, uh, might follow the lines of cleavage when one takes a step back and looks at the whole patient, or, or in some cases may be difficult to make that out. But uh, looking at the morphology of the individual lesions, look at the papules with this uh, sort of um, trailing scale um, and uh, a herald patch the first uh, patch that precedes the widespread eruption shown on the right. Now, skin cancers are another example of, uh, of conditions where there are some specific uh, variations in, in different uh, uh, racial ethnic populations. There are differences in anatomic distribution, differences in the prevalence, differences in the clinical presentation of, uh, of many of the major uh, skin cancer types, and we'll talk about those briefly. So um, starting with basal cell carcinomas, one of the key differences in skin of color is that approximately 50% of cases are pigmented. So they may not present with a pink pearly 
translucent uh, uh, papule with tel telangiectasias, but instead be uh, pigmented. Uh, and the key is to look at the translucency of the border and keep an open mind. Um, and uh, sometimes these can mimic, uh, not in this picture, but sometimes they can mimic uh, dermatosis papulosa nigra that looks irritated or, or, or in, in, inflamed, but in, but uh, while well, in closer inspection might have a slightly translucent border or some crust, which one would not expect from a DPN and should be biopsied. This one is so pigmented, it almost resembles a melanoma. But again, that translucency, at the, particularly at the border, is, is so characteristic of basal cell carcinoma. Melanomas, um, key difference is the anatomic location where they're mostly found in skin of color, and that would be the sole of the foot is the number one location. But palms, soles, mucous membranes uh, we are, are the sites that we find melanomas. Uh, more frequently than the uh, sun exposed areas in richly pigmented skin types. And squamous cell carcinoma on the right, uh, it turns out is actually um, the most common uh, skin cancer type in uh, populations with, rich, with uh, um, higher skin phototypes, including fives and sixes, such as um, African-Americans and others of African descent. Some more examples on the left as uh, superficial basal cell carcinoma in an individual with, with uh, skin of color. And on the right, cutaneous T-cell lymphoma or mycosis fungoides, which is um, more frequently seen, uh, has a higher prevalence in populations of, of color, in particular uh, African-Americans. Um, so I've covered some of these details, but we're gonna go, go uh, over them um, a, a little bit more basal cell carcinomas and skin of color, it's actually the second most common skin cancer in the highest end of the Fitzpatrick spectrum. So in, in Black individuals, as well as South Asians, uh, BCC is actually second most common and not the first most common as it is in lighter skinned populations. We often see delays in diagnosis due to low public awareness and, and uh, other factors, as well as a low uh, clinical index of suspicion among uh, healthcare providers in some cases. Now, squamous cell carcinoma, as I mentioned, is actually the most common skin cancer in Black populations and South Asian populations uh, with uh, deeply pigmented skin. And um, one aspect of squamous cell carcinomas in populations with skin of color is that they tend to arise with, with a great degree of free, of uh, a great proportion of these tend to arise in non-sun exposed areas. Uh, these are the type that are associated with areas of chronic inflammation, chronic wounds, chronic scarring processes. And it's these types of squamous cell carcinomas that have a uh, worse prognosis and a higher rate of metastasis. Um, so when we look at mortality rates of squamous cell carcinoma uh, of the kind arising uh, in these processes, we can see major differences in the met 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 uh, metastatic rates. Uh, and so it becomes it's just increasingly important, uh, especially important to be able to diagnose these um, early. Now, when it comes to melanoma uh, in populations with skin of color, uh, again, uh, the foot is the most common location. But when we look at the, the incidence rates, we see these, these uh, great differences across racial ethnic populations with the lowest rates in um, Black individuals and, and those um, belonging to Asian Pacific Islander um, uh, racial category. Uh, and we see the highest rates among non-Hispanic whites. And you can see uh, on the right, the various differences and stark differences in terms of prevalence. But the problem is when melanoma does occur in patient populations with skin of color, even though it's far less prevalent, when it does occur, it tends to arise and be diagnosed, tends to be diagnosed at a later stage and hence uh, has a worse prognosis. And given that the foot is the most common uh, anatomic location, as well as palms, uh, so acral sites. Um, the, it, it comes as no surprise that the most common histo, histologic, histogenic subtype uh, in patients with skin of color is the acral lentiginous type. 
And unfortunately, um, when looking at melanoma survival rates, we see great disparities uh, across populations with uh, uh, lower rates of survival uh, in populations of color, especially Black or African American patients. And this is across multiple studies. So shifting gears to disorders that disproportionately affect populations with skin of color. We're gonna start with uh, this follicular disorder called pseudofolliculitis barbae, um, commonly known as razor bumps to the, to the lay person, um, but presents with uh, inflammatory papules that are follicular or perifollicular. There may be pustules, there's often associated post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. This uh, typically involves the anterior and lateral neck as the most common location, but can affect any of the uh, beard area. And we can see it in other anatomic locations off the face where shaving is, is, is done either by men or by women. Keloids are a potential sequela in, in uh, severe cases. Um, and uh, this is a typical presentation of keloids secondary to PFB along the, uh, the jawline here. This is extremely common. Um, the literature reports between 45 to 83% of black men um, uh, suffer from this. Historically, it's been the source of racial tensions in the military, and even more recently been the source of tensions within certain workplaces where a clean shaven face is required. Um, the etiology of this, it's a foreign body, um, an inflammatory reaction of the re-entered hair shaft in the hair shaft can enter from the outside in called extra follicular penetration as shown on the left or it can pierce the follicular wall and curl right into the dermis um, without ever exiting the skin surface and that's called trans follicular penetration shown on the right and uh, te techniques like very close shaving um, can exacerbate this uh, contribute to trans follicular uh, penetration so we don't have time to go into treatments for this, but uh, shaving modification and uh, topical anti-inflammatory therapies are some of the approaches. Another follicular disorder that disproportionately affects skin of color is acne keloidalis nuke. It's not acne, it's not a keloid, but it's AKN, acne keloidalis nuke, presents with these keloid-like, these fibrotic uh, papules that often coalesce to plaques. They occur on the posterior scalp and the nape of the neck. Um, there may be pustules and crusts involved. The etiology is not clear. It's not ingrown hairs. There's evidence to, sh to show that it's not related to ingrown hairs, contrary to uh, popular belief. Um, but um, other theories have been proposed, including fibrosis secondary to a mechanically induced folliculitis um, uh, is, uh, has been proposed by some authors. But uh, uh, this is still uh, an entity that uh, is not completely understood as to what drives it. Uh, when patients get it, uh, they, um, as one can imagine, haircuts are often associated with bleeding and irritation, and the trauma from haircuts might be an exacerbating factor here, as are other traumatic factors like picking, scratching, or friction from tight-fitting hats uh, or other headgear. Melasma. Uh, and other disorders of hyperpigmentation uh, disproportionately affect patients with skin of color. Melasma typically presents with symmetrical brown or hyperpigmented patches uh, on the cheeks, the forehead, the upper lip. Um, even extra facial sites can sometimes occur, like such as the forearms or the scalp. Um, men uh, do get this as well, although it's predominantly in women and uh, sun is a key factor as are hormonal factors and genetic factors. This slide is uh, mislabeled. Actually, it's keloids uh, that's being shown here. And keloids uh, have um, uh, reportedly occurred more frequently, do occur more frequently in populations of African descent and other populations with skin of color. And by definition, keloids uh, are scars that um, expand beyond the area of injury. Uh, to differentiate them from hypertrophic scars, where the elevation of the scar is still confined to the area of initial injury. And the earlobe is, of course, a very common location and can affect the anterior and posterior uh, ear earlobes. We can see it from trauma or from inflammatory conditions. 
Attraction alopecia, patients who present with uh, reduced hair density in the frontotemporal scalp, um, they may have this uh, uh, so-called fringe sign, which involves sort of preservation of the anterior edge of the hairline or fringe, followed by um, significant loss in the, in the middle um, of the area of involvement. Um, this is a helpful uh, way to make the diagnosis, traction alopecia, and differentiate it from uh, other conditions such as frontal fibrosing alopecia, which can also affect the same location. Um, dissecting cellulitis, which presents with boggy separative nodules and interconnecting sinus tracts on the scalp. This disproportionately affects men of African ancestry and is a follicular occlusion disorder um, that um, can present with other disorders of follicular occlusion, which I'll, I'll comment on in just a moment. But here's another clinical example. You can see these crusts uh, as well as the development of scarring alopecia. And some of these scars even resemble keloids here. More examples of this sort of interconnecting a boggy separative uh, nodules. Um, and of course, this is very disfiguring for patients. It's primarily a, a neutrophilic uh, primary uh, cicatricial alopecia and can be treated with um, oral tetracyclines, um, isotretinoin, TNF inhibitors. Um, as a disorder of follicular occlusion, we could see it on its own, but we can also see it uh, in the context of other uh, follicular occlusion disorders, such as hidradenitis superativa, which we'll talk about, acne, uh, acne conglobata, uh, and pilonidal cyst. It can also, in much less commonly, uh, be associated with other uh, uh, diseases and syndromes. Um, and rarely, um, it, it, it can even progress, and this is rare, but there are case reports of squamous cell carcinoma arising at sites of poorly controlled, long-standing dissecting cellulitis of the scalp. A very similar occlu uh, follicular occlusion disorder, similar sort of mechanistically and other aspects too, but in different anatomic locations as HS, where we see in, instead of the scalp involvement of the axillae, the, the breasts, um, the groin, the buttock area, uh, seeing double comedones or three comedones in a line uh, is uh, a common feature, scars, sinus tracts, uh, separative nodules, um, draining sinuses, um, very disfiguring and, um, uh, and uh, disabling uh, in advanced cases. And this does disproportionately affect patients uh, with skin of color, in particular, um, uh, Black or African-American populations have higher prevalence uh, of this. Now, multisystemic disorders that have cutaneous manifestations, such as systemic lupus, uh, is an example of one such disorder that is more frequently seen in skin of color. When we look at the prevalence rates, we see in the U.S. higher rates among um, African, Hispanic, African American, Hispanic, and Asian populations, um, and uh, in particular, African American women. Discoid lupus, which can be a feature of systemic lupus or can be seen as a standalone um, uh, entity, um, has myriad presentations, but uh, this is a great example of a very common location of the conchal bowl of the ear, where we can see um, severe um, hyperpigmentation and follicular plugging uh, and hints of, of uh, red and um, violaceous hue within some of these patches and plaques. Approximately 28% of DLA patient, DLE patients can go on to develop systemic lupus, and so it's important to follow these patients and perform serological workup and take a good review of systems as well. African Americans have a much higher uh, incidence rate. It's been reported to be three time, 3.9 times greater than in whites. 
we often see this be the uh, DLE be the cause of severe dispigmentation, including depigmented areas that can, such as the one on the right, which on first glance might resemble vitiligo in some ways, but it's not vitiligo. It's a um, se se um, severe scarring for, as a result of DLE, as similar on the left as a scarring alopecia uh, caused by DLE. And we can still make out while there are areas that are somewhat burnt out with just scarring, there are certainly many active areas here. We can still see the erythema scaling um, and very carefully may see some follicular plugging. This is a great close-up uh, of a patch of alopecia within the center of this patch is this erythema. Um, and then the periphery of the erythematous zone, we can see some follicular um, scaling and follicular plugging. Um, and this is really important to recognize uh, to be able to catch early before there's end-stage scarring and other sequelae. Now, sarcoidosis, another multi-system disorder that's disproportionately seen in populations of color. Sarcoidosis is often called a great imitator. Um, it, it has many different morphologies, um, including uh, these annular dermal uh, plaques um, that can be um, red-brown in color or uh, deep red, uh, purplish, violet, violaceous hue uh, is also very common. When it affects the nose, as in on, on the left, we call it lupus perneo, even though it is not lupus. Um, and um, uh, another example of involvement of the nasal area and the lips. And uh, this reddish brown dermal uh, papules uh, involving the nose and the cheeks in this patient of African descent. Now, African Americans are more commonly and more severely affected. The highest incidence is among Black women, 30 to 39 years uh, of age in the United States. Um, and um, continuous involvement is often the way the um, uh, other systemic involvement is made. So many of these patients come to us first and um, by doing a biopsy, we're able to confirm the diagnosis and then get them plugged in with uh, their uh, primary care physician and uh, other specialists to manage the multisystemic disease of sarcoidosis. What about scleroderma? Another example of a multisystemic disorder that disproportionately affects uh, patients of color. One thing I want to highlight is this tendency to present with this salt and pepper like dis dispigmentation. We often see the example on the left here, but we often see it on, on the chest or on the upper back um, and on palpation. This area may have, have sometimes only subtle but sometimes more pronounced uh, 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 bound down or slightly indurated uh, texture. But when you see the salt and pepper uh, dispigmentation, you must think scleroderma and examine other places to look for features such as the digits and where one can see sclerodactyly and uh, bound down taut skin and uh, ask about Reynolds phenomenon and other features, of course. Um, it's been shown in some studies that um, African Americans may develop symptoms at an earlier age and have an increased uh, um, morbidity and mortality compared to white patients, higher incidence in black women, um, and uh, so very important to recognize. Um, dermatomyositis, another example where we as dermatologists can make a big difference in, in um, diagnosing a multisystemic disease. Um, being able to recognize the erythematous uh, patches and plaques in uh, often in photo distributed areas uh, um, uh, as in as in this example on the on the left, the eyelids, periorbital area, very key to, to detect periorbital edema and, and erythema um, uh, or just hyperchromia uh, around the eyes. And then, of course, the Grotron's papules on the hand. And note that uh, violaceous, um, violaceous to uh, brown hue of these papules. Um, the um, Ethnic and racial variations include more common, higher prevalence among African Americans than, um, than whites in the United States. And so now in the last few minutes, I just want to highlight a few serious 
dermatologic conditions that we would not want to miss in the skin of color. Uh, the first is what should be called cutaneous small vessel vasculitis, which on pathology uh, may show leukocytoclastic vasculitis or LCV. The patient presents with palpable purpuric lesions. That is by definition, um, um, red or purple lesions that do not blanch on pressure. Um, and while this picture, I think, is very clear, anybody can see the, the, the pur purplish color of these lesions. In some cases, um, the diagnosis might be missed um, if uh, one is looking for red and purple, but maybe on, in a darker skin patient might present as, as a deeper, uh, deeper hyperchromia. So be, um, on the, be mindful of uh, hyperchromatic lesions that are elevated and do not blanch uh, that erupt on the legs in particular and other places uh, in, um, in patients. And it's important to recognize this because uh, of potential associations beyond the skin. Uh, triggers include infections, uh, medications are very a very common uh, trigger, autoimmune disorders, rheumatolo including rheumatologic ones, and in some cases neoplastic disorders. Erythema multiforme, um, which uh, we all know um, presents with these classic targetoid lesions, but in skin of color, um, the the targetoid lesions might be a little bit more subtle if one is looking for. Uh, classic red, but so instead you may see uh, more of a reddish brown, and it's really that duskiness of the center and, and that central portion of the lesion, that target that should be, raise one's uh, awareness or, or one's suspicion for EM. And there's a, typically uh, involvement of the mucous membranes and the palms, the soles are often involved as well as shown in that example. Now, probably the among the most serious conditions that we could possibly see in dermatology is Stevens-Johnson syndrome, uh, where there's full thickness uh, necrosis and sloughing of the, of, the, uh, uh, of, of the epidermis as a result of medications. So whereas erythema multiforme is usually triggered by infections, HSV being number one, uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome is induced by medications. And the, it's ideal to be able to detect this at earlier stages, such as here, uh, where we see these dusky, violaceous uh, patches. And then in the case of the upper lesion here, there's the development of a bulla, and there would be Nikolsky sign here. Um, it's far better to, to be able to catch it at this stage, of course, and intervene early to hopefully prevent it from advancing to this more severe stage. Um, and lastly, drug-induced hypersensitivity syndromes, such as uh, drug reaction with the acephalia and systemic symptoms. Um, so while in this image, we can pretty much appreciate the red hue of these uh, erythematous papules that have coalesced to plaques involving the trunk and the extremities, uh, there are certainly many examples in, in, in very deeply pigmented individuals where the redness may not jump out uh, at your eye as easily. And again, those same techniques of being able to uh, try to normalize, calibrate your eye to the normal skin and compare to the lesional skin and listen to the patient as well, who can really inform you that which areas are extremely inflamed and abnormal to them. And then palpation and side lighting to really be able to detect the, um, the fact that this is a uh, more biliform eruption, and in this case, associated with systemic symptoms. So with that, um, I hope that this broad tour of, of common and serious uh, dermatologic conditions uh, that can affect patients with skin of color, I hope this was helpful. Uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing some of your questions. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Chen. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexis, for that uh, wonderful tour of common and rare and serious uh, skin conditions in patients with skin of color. I know I, I personally learned a lot. We do have some time set aside for questions. And so if you haven't already, feel free to use the Q&A uh, the Q&A section to put a question in and we can get those to Dr. Alexis um, uh, for a quick answer. Um, while that's going in, if it's okay, I'm going to start with one of my own questions for you. Is there a, 
I'm curious if there is a theoretical reason for why papillonodular atopic dermatitis is thought to be more common in patients with skin of color. Um, whether it's conjecture, I'm just curious what your thoughts are as to why that might happen more frequently. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. It's an observation that's been made. We don't have a clear uh, answer mechanistically as to why this is. Is there, are there genetic factors? Are there other factors that contributed to it? One potential explanation is that uh, we do, there is evidence for racial ethnic variations in pruritus, in pruritus uh, prevalence and pruritus severity, and possibly that uh, severe pruritus associated with AD leading to more vigorous scratching and picking excoriation of the skin might contribute to a greater tendency of lichenification and papillonodule uh, formation. But it's a great question that deserves more study. Great, excellent, thank you so much. Um, and then in that vein, I'm also curious, you know, obviously it's sometimes it can be on the same spectrum depending on how much pruritus we're dealing with in atopic dermatitis, but you mentioned that sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate between pruigonodularis and the papillonodular kind of type of atopic dermatitis. I'm just curious if you have any bedside tips in terms of differentiating or if you think of them as kind of on the same spectrum. Yes, I think that I we can certainly see patients who have atopic dermatitis, they meet criteria for atopic dermatitis, such as the Hanifin Rajka criteria. Um, they, you know, they have a positive family history of atopy, they have other atopic diseases, they have areas of classic um, uh, manifestations, clinical manifestations of AD, but in addition to that, have what resemble paragonodularis, uh, so um, uh, paragonodularis-like lesions. On the other hand, we have patients who, who have the clinical manifestations of paragonodularis in the absence of atopy. So I, I, I think that we can see PN as its own entity, but we can also see PN as a morphology uh, in, in the spectrum of atopic dermatitis. Wonderful. Um, we have a question uh, from Stacy. What is your preference for treating melasma? Yeah, thank you for your for your question, Stacy, about melasma treatment. So the mainstay of at least in the short term for treatment is hydroquinone based therapy um, using a what's we like to call the modified Kligman Willis formula, which includes hydroquinone, tretinoin, and a, and fluosinolone. Of course, it's or other modifications of that concept: hydroquinone, retinoin, and a corticosteroid in a fixed combination. Um, a typical, typically doing that for three to six months continuously, no, not longer, um, and then transitioning to a non-hydroquinone-based therapy for for longer-term management. That would include azelaic acid. It would include retinoids. It would include a whole long list of other cosmeceutical agents like cysteamine, um, kojic acid, and, other, and uh, niacinamide, and uh, topical tranexamic acid, and many others. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and then one last question. Uh, you mentioned that in East Asian populations, you have this interesting overlap of atopic dermatitis and psoriasiform kind of findings. Just curious, when it comes to treatment, um, what do you target? Do you target more the atopic dermatitis? Do you target more the psoriasis um, or kind of all of the above? Yeah, great question. And at least in my experience, that scenario, that morphology of this psoriasiform um, type of atopic dermatitis um, seen um, described more commonly in East Asian populations, I still, uh, in my experience, using AD-directed therapies, still targeting IL-4, IL-13, for example, um, is the most effective strategy. Um, I have not personally seen um, targeting um, IL-17, for example, uh, in that scenario being um, more effective than, than treating the, the AD as one normally would. Wonderful. Well, thank you to everyone for submitting questions. Um, unfortunately, our Q&A period can only be so long because we have to get to our interactive Kahoot quiz that comes with a wonderful prize. Thank you again, Dr. Alexis, for your time and your expertise tonight. 
Um, for all of our participants, our audience members, um, I encourage you to take part in our Kahoot quiz, um, just some logistical uh, tips. It is easiest to be on two devices if possible. So keep the one that you're on currently open. And if you can grab your phone or your tablet, another device to open up the Kahoot app or go to kahoot.it and you can type in the game pin to get started. Um, you should be able to see on your screen, the game pin is 982064. Um, and you can go ahead and join the game whenever you're ready. We will be giving out a $100 Amazon gift card to the winner of tonight's Kahoot quiz. And so uh, if, if that's not uh, reason enough, you can also join, of course, to test your own knowledge based on the information we just learned from Dr. Alexis. So um, if everyone can take a moment to sign in now for the Kahoot quiz, that would be wonderful. And if you are, I, I, I believe everyone can see the screen. The game pin is right up there, 982064. You can use that QR code as well, um, if that is easier. But go ahead and do that now so they can join in for this prize for the winner at the end. While folks are signing into the Kahoot quiz, um, Dr. Alexis, would it be okay if I asked you one more question that came in that I personally am very interested in. You mentioned ways to prevent pseudofolliculitis pseudo barbae. Um, any tips on preventing AKN, acne cuidalis nuke? Um, and while Dr. Alexis is answering, and encourage everyone to still sign up for the Kahoot quiz um, with all those in instructions right in front of you. Dr. Alexis? Yeah, so yeah, thanks for the additional question about acne, kilo Dallas nuke, and ways to prevent that. Um, so because we know that mechanical irritation of the posterior scalp nuchal area uh, are is that's a factor in, uh, in terms of exacerbating the condition, uh, behavioral modification to avoid picking, scratching, rubbing of the area, avoiding the w wearing of tight fitting hats uh, to the area. Uh, also, because there's a tendency for secondary bacterial infection, uh, which which can also exacerbate the, the condition, I'll also include a uh, antimicrobial cleanser, such as chlorhexidine daily to that area in conjunction with prescription therapy, such as tetracyclines like doxycycline, intralesional injections of corticosteroids, usually uh, from 10 milligrams per cc, per cc all the way up to 40 milligrams per cc if the, the keloid-like the, the keloid papules and plaques are severe enough. Uh, so I hope that answers your question. That's wonderful. Um, I thank you so much for that uh, great answer. Uh, I have also been informed that apparently the Kahoot pin isn't working. Uh, some of you who are clearly in the audience also have my cell phone number because I got a couple frantic texts about it as well. Um, we are working on it right now. So stay tuned while we sort out whether we can get Kahoot up and running. Um, I think we are hopefully going to get that up for everyone. But again, I think I've learned a lot. I think one of the, just to remind everyone, there is an educational supplement up top on your screen that you can download. Actually, one of the most helpful things I think in that supplement that I have appreciated is um, the, there's a general tips on how to evaluate um, skin of color in terms of these conditions that we're talking about. And a lot of the things that Dr. Alexis shared with us are also there for um, free information for you to take with you. Hopefully that'll be helpful for everyone. Um, all right, we are reloading Kahoot to see if we can make that work. And Dr. Chen, as you're waiting for this to reload, reload, I can also add to your question or my response to your question about AKN, uh, advising patients to avoid uh, uh, very low haircuts with friction from the from the uh, electric clippers. Um, so working with their barber to uh, uh, reduce the degree of friction from electric clippers, that's a very key, key piece of advice for the patients. No, that's, that's super helpful. Um, thank you for that extra bit of information. Um, for those who are trying to log into the Kuhu, I think, ah, oh, there we go. We have Derm Girl as our first entry, so we know it's working. Your game pin looks like it's 1870033. You can have the QR code. Dr. Alexis, thank you for helping us get more information about AKN while we troubleshoot Kahoot, which I think, um, to be honest, is 
obviously super helpful in the care of our everyday care of our patients. So again, so much high yield information that was helpful tonight. Um, thank you for everything. For our, for our participants, um, now is the time to log into Kahoot. Um, otherwise, Durham Girl is going to be playing with a game of one, and they're definitely going to win this gift card. All right, we've got Durham Girl, Durham Guy, Durham Doc. So lots of Durham focused, which is understandable. Um, all right, keep on logging in. I see five participants now. I know that there were quite a few people on the webinar, so there's a lot more of you who can be vying for this gift card. Great. Um, again, reminder, you have the game pin up there. You can use the website, kahoot.it. You can download the Kahoot app. You can use that QR code. Basically, we're giving you so many different ways to sign in to take advantage of this chance to win a $100 gift card from Amazon. Um, Keep on going. If there's more people that are, it looks like people are just starting to log in, uh, just starting to sign in now. Um, and I uh, reminder that what how this will work is that the Kahoot is basically a series of um, images, of course, curated from Visual DX, and you'll just have to give the right diagnosis for each one. Nothing too complicated, um, but rather just a chance to test your knowledge after learning from Dr. Alexis and. Um, using all the tips that we just learned about examining skin um, with people in, in patients with richly melanated skin, which I, which I think is a, a, a great thing to obviously for us to focus on tonight and for us to carry on into the future as we take care of our patients. Um, we have 26 registered so far. So I think as we uh, keep on signing in, but we'll probably launch the game relatively soon. It's coming up, uh, up on eight o'clock and I wanna make sure that we try to respect everyone's time. Um, all right, here we go. We'll get started. Good luck, everyone.
Right. Congratulations to our winner, Fluti Tuti, who looks like came from behind and took the podium on the last question. We'll be reaching out and sending you a $100 Amazon gift card. So I wanted to, uh, just as a parting reminder, our master educational program continues on October 19th. We have Kodachromes, Hair Disorders in Patients of Color with Dr. Chisana Kindred. Dr. Kindred is a board certified dermatologist, researcher, published author and national speaker. We have three more webinars remaining this year and I encourage all of you to register now so you won't miss um, any of them. 